Hi, and welcome to your second session of microbiology. I want to give you a little bit of a heads up and a warning that in this session, where we'll be covering objectives from chapters two through five, it seems like a lot of information. But please be reminded that um, you will be quizzed and tested on what are in these objectives and what I sometimes will also add to the lectures. So if you're taking good notes and you can stop and start them as you're going along, um, then everything should be fine with that. So let's go ahead and get started. In microbiology, we have a saying, well, actually in pathology, we have a saying, since most diagnostic um, information is coming from the laboratory, that the diagnosis can only be as good as the specimen and the integrity of the specimen that was sent to, to us. So it's going to be very important for people who are actually collecting those specimens, especially the nurses and doctors, that they know exactly how to collect the specimens. Because we know and we remember that there's nothing more um, devastating, rapidly devastating to a human body than an infectious disease. And unfortunately, time is everything. So if you don't get a good specimen that's collected and sent to the lab, then you actually really can miss the diagnosis. And it can be a matter of life and death without sounding too um, dramatic or theatrical about that. That's really the case. And it's really the truth. So I will be trying to go through these objectives. I've got the PowerPoints, a lot of information, but I'm going to try to roll through them and hopefully that what I'm saying will make some sense to you. So again, remember that this is from your textbook, so you can always refer and read more if you need it to. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So when we're thinking about collecting specimens, they're the five eyes that we think about with microbiology. They are inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, and identification. So once the specimen is collected, it's received into the microbiology laboratory and it's going to have to be inoculated on very specific type media so that we would have a chance at all in getting that microbe growing out so that we could do a definitive diagnosis of that disease. Everything about microbe is getting to the definitive diagnosis because that's going to determine which best treatment it is. We have to know if we're dealing with a bacteria because bacteria are treated with, can be sometimes treated with antibiotics that will affect them, but antibiotics will not help against protozoa. We would have to have an anti-protozoal if it's a protozoa causing disease. Similar, if we had a fungus causing the disease and we thought it was bacterial, we would be completely wrong and actually causing harm to the patient if we were giving them an antibiotic rather than an antifungal agent. Same thing with viruses, and viruses are actually the predominant cause of, of human disease. But if we treat with, with antibiotics and it's really a virus, we could actually be harming the patient and delaying their recovery. So it's all about getting the right specimen, getting the definitive diagnosis, we know what we're dealing with, and then that is going to lead us to making sure that we understand that we're doing the right thing with the treatment. Because if you're treating somebody for something they do not have, you are typically harming them. So um, these five eyes are very, very important. Depending on what type of specimen you get, whether it's a sputum or stool culture or a skin scraping or cerebrospinal fluid or blood, it's going to dictate what type of um, incubation is going to be needed. And then once the incubation happens, a lot of times, even if we get the specimens growing, they're going to have some mixed normal flora in there with it, so we're going to have to isolate that organism. And then absolutely, once inspection is occurring on the media, the special medias, then we're going to be able to use identification processes to help to identify, getting that information in as quickly as possible. Some of the media that's used, most of the time these microbes, they're living in you, they're living on you and in you. So we kind of know what we might need to feed them and get them growing. So a lot of times we use, we definitely include something called enriched media, which just means that it's going to be, um, it's going to provide the nutrition that the microbes are going to need to survive. So enriched media is going to have food for the microbes. Some microorganisms are very picky though, and I would like you to know the definition of a fastidious organism, microorganism. That means it's a microbe that's going to require special 
uh, nutrients to survive. And we know which microbes they are in the pathology lab. Uh, an example of one of those is Haemophilus influenza. This is a microorganism that can cause pneumonia. It can cause conjunctivitis. It can cause uh, epiglottitis. We'll talk about some of these diseases later on. But we know if we get a specimen that there could be a possibility that Haemophilus influenza is in there then we're gonna to have to give it the special enriched media, the media that we know is for those picky organisms. Another microbe that we know is like that is Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea is a bacteria that, as you maybe suspect, causes gonorrhea. So if we get a specimen such as um, exudates from um, the urethras or vagina, uh, vaginas, then the vaginal flora or um, vaginas, then we're going to have to make sure that we include a media that is really enriched to get those fastidious organisms growing out. So the pathology lab takes care of that uh, and knows usually what, what might be suspected depending on the specimen that's collected and we'll make sure that the right media is going to be selected so that those organisms can grow out. So selective media is, is a type of media that we use sometimes when we know that the specimen we're going to get is contaminated. For example, if you get a throat swab into the lab, you know there's a lot of normal microorganisms that live in the throat. You can't really take the swab and say, okay, um, please try to bypass all the normal microbes. There's going to be a lot of things growing on that swab, including the normal normal healthy organisms. So what we do in those cases is we use a medium that we have put things in that will make it select and select out just for what we're looking for. We can use a lot of different things in doing that. We can make media selective by changing the pH of the media or adding certain sugars or certain antibiotics. So there are a lot of different ways that we can use media to select out those organisms. And again, the reason we do this is so that we can get to that definitive identification of that microbe as quickly as possible so that the right treatment is happening as quickly as possible. Differential media is me media that is often usually selective as well as differential. And differential means that when you're looking at it the next day, the, those microbes growing up the next day on the plate, you can differentiate. They look different from each other. Like some of them may appear a certain color where the others don't have that color. Or some of them may be hemolyzing. That means splitting the blood auger that you've put them on and others are non hemolytic. So you can actually just macroscopically look at the organisms and see that they look different. Uh, and that helps you to differentiate between them. So it gives you an idea right away just from looking at them what they may be. And again, that's helping you with that identification, getting it as quickly as possible. So obviously, all of that is used to help us with the inspection and the identification, and we've just talked about the importance of it. As far as microbial size go goes, we understand that um, human cells are huge, and, and, and they're much, much bigger than bacterial cells. So this gives you, this slide gives you a little bit of idea about the differences in the sizes when we're talking about bacteria versus protozoa versus fungi versus human cells, and then even viruses, which are the smallest things that we know that can cause disease. Again, your textbook does a good job of giving you a visualization with some of these graphics about how small some of these microbes can be. We had already discussed maybe that microbiology, we call this because we call it this because it's the study of the microbial world, the world that's so small that we can't see it with the naked eye. We're going to have to use special lenses to be able to identify these microorganisms. And to do that, usually all we need in a clinical microbiology lab is going to be what's called a light compound microscope. I would want you all to know that this is the most common type of microscope that's used for diagnostic purposes in pathology. A light compound microscope is called, called that because its power source, source is just from a light and it's compound because there are two sets of lenses. I would want you to know that the, the lenses that you are close to your eyes that you're looking through are called the ocular lenses and there's a magnification associated with those. It's usually 10x, not always, but usually. And then the second set of lenses that your your um, 
your optics are coming through, the image of your microorganism comes through, are called the the objective lenses that we think about. These objective lenses, this nose piece, holds several different sizes of objectives. We always start with the low power objective or scanning uh, objective, which is a very low power magnification. And then once we have our specimen in view and we have it clearly in view, we can move the nose piece around. We can rotate it around to the higher objective lens magnifications. If we were focused on the low power, we will still be focused when we move that objective lens, trying to bring our image up more and more so that we can actually inspect it and help to identify what we are looking at. So a, a compound microscope is really a very easy um, instrument to use. A lot of people have phobias about trying to thinking that they can't use this this equipment but once they're in the lab they realize that it's a very simple instrument to use and as long as you're taking care of it and using some basic rules it's going to be um, really helpful to you and, and absolutely an, an integral part of your identification process so again and looking at this microscope there is a base on the microscope that has the light you put your specimen, your microscope slide that you've prepared, you put that on what is called the stage of the microscope. And then you begin with the shortest little objective lens that's the scanning objective lens. It can be either the 4X or the 10X. And you, you use your course adjustment knob bringing the stage up. The course adjustment knob brings the stage up until while you are looking through the ocular lenses, you get a perfectly clear image. Once you get that clear image, you are able to move your objective nose piece going to the higher objective lens magnifications, seeing, bringing the specimen up in magnification until you can really uh, make some, some significant observations about it to help with the ID. After you have moved from the low power objectives, you never touch the course objective the coarse uh, focus knob again. The only thing you have to use is the little fine focus knob and you should be fine. As far as like understanding what your magnif how to achieve your magnification, you always take the ocular magnification, it's usually 10x, not always, but usually, and you multiply it by whatever the objective lens you are using is. So if you are looking at the 40x objective lens and you have 10x ocular lens objectives, then your specimen is magnified 400 times for you because 10 times the 40 would mean that you have brought that specimen up 400 times its size and you are able to see those kind of details. Usually the maximum amount of magnification you can achieve with a light compound microscope is 1000x because usually the highest objective lens is a 100x lens and if you have the 10x oculars times the 100x uh, objective then then that's a thousand x and that is the, typically the highest magnification for bacteria to be able to see bacteria you, it really does require well well it really does require the 1000 x magnification human cells we can see at 100 X. So we can see on low power magnification human cells, they're huge, but to really see detail and contrast for bacteria, we're going to have to use the highest magnification possible. For protozoa, for fungi, for helminths, which are worms, we can usually see those on 100 magnification, so the 10x times the low power 10x magnification. That was just a quick overview. I hope that um, that, that sort of made sense to you. I hope that it did. And anyway, again, please go to your textbook if you feel like you need a little bit more on that, but I wouldn't ask you any more than what I covered. Again, the usual microscope in a pathology department, and certainly in microbiology, is going to be the light compound microscope. Every now and then, though, we do need to use special scopes, specialized scopes. The special scopes that we use are going to be um, we're going to use sometimes um, dark field microscopy and fluorescent microscopy. Those are going to 
those are usually going to be things that we use when we suspect very low numbers of the organisms to be present and it's going to be vital that we try to do everything we can within minutes or hours of getting a specimen to try to give some information. So um, these dark field and fluorescent scopes we're going to use when we have a specimen like cerebrospinal fluid. And there may just be one or two of the organisms on the slide from that patient sample. And to be able to see them, we can get into a dark room and turn out the light. And, and the only light that would be coming at us would be from those when we're looking through the scope is going to be from the microbes that might be present and it just gives us an, a great chance and opportunity to maybe get those get that ID to them quicker than it would be if we had to wait for the organisms to grow on, on special media selective and differential media so again I feel like I'm rushing through this I hope you don't feel that way but anyway um, I am trying to give you the basic information. As far as stains go, um, I do want you all to know that, you know, these microbes, when you see pictures of them, aren't they gorgeous? They're purple and they are pink and they have all kinds of fluorescence um, that you see in these pictures. But in nature, they don't, because if they did, we would be seeing those colors. Uh, so obviously in nature, these we couldn't see these unless we used something that like stains that would help us to see them once we have them on fixed slides. So um, there are many different types of stains. There are simple stains and there are differential stains. But what I'd like you to know too basically from this is that we use the stains to be able to see these, um, to inspect these, these microbes and to be able to see details about the microbes that again helps to get us to the identification as quickly as possible. I definitely want you all to know um, that the most common stain is the gram stain. That is, I just can't tell you how important that is, is a diagnostic stain in microbiology. Dr. Graham actually um, came up with this procedure and giving us the stain that we use now, we can still continue to use today as the most important stain in microbiology as far as identifying bacteria. And what this stain is, is actually a complex stain. It's not just a simple stain. A simple stain is just going to be one stain. So everything in the, on the slide is going to look the same in color because most things are going to take that one stain up. Dr. Graham devised a staining technique, though, where he used a two-staining technique with a decolorization in the middle of that. So what he found when he did this, when he used the, the violet, which you can imagine is dark purple, violet and iodine complex, he used that stain, but he thought, well, and everything looked violet on the slide, but he thought to himself, well, what would happen um, if I used some sort of like decolorizer, like alcohol, would they all, would that violet complex all rinse out? And then maybe if I used a different color, like a pink saffronin or counter stain, would everything then look pink? But what he found out was that some microbes hold the violet complex, that purple, dark, dark purple, almost black looking stain, while other organisms couldn't do that. Other bacteria couldn't do that. And the alcohol would wash that out of their cell walls and they would take the counter stain, the stain that was used next, and they would appear pink. So he, he kind of wondered like why that is. And interestingly enough, he didn't even really know. He never lived long enough to really know exactly what was going on at a molecular and cellular level. But what we know is, that, and we still classify bacteria by this, is that the ones that hold the purple, dark purple violet iodine complex are called gram-positive organisms. And the ones that can't hold it are called gram-negative organisms and microorganisms. And they're absolutely classified and named based off of the Graham's reaction. The Graham-positive organisms have a much thicker cell wall and the Graham-negatives have a much thinner cell wall that's higher in lipid content. Now you might be thinking to yourself, oh my god, I don't care. But you know what? We do care because what we know is that we have we have chemicals, we have chemotherapeutics, chemicals that act as therapeutic um, devices for us to treat these microbes. 
and we can use different ones targeting the thick wall, gram positive ones, versus the thin wall, gram negatives. We target those cell walls now in, in our selective antibiotic use. So um, this is very important to us and we do know that it's important. So just to give you an idea too about gram positives, some gram positives that you've heard of, gram positive organisms, Staphylococcus aureus, y'all have all heard of Staph aureus, that is a gram positive organism. Streptococcus, that has many genuses, but Streptococcus, one of the which ones that cause strep throat, those are gram positive organisms. E. coli, which we've already mentioned these, E. coli, Shrikia coli, that's a gram negative organism. It tells us that we also know about its cell wall. It's going to be very different in um, what it looks like and how we can treat it than the gram positives are. So again, classification is, is of bacteria are based on gram reaction. So great. Now some microbes, we've seen some bacteria, and this is all about bacteria right now, but some bacteria actually can't pick won't hold those stains very well. And so there's another very important, this will probably be the next most important stain in micro, it's called the acid mass stain. One of the most important reasons that we have um, for you all to know about this acid mass stain is going to be because of a bacterium known as mycobacterium tuberculosis. And as you can imagine, what this causes is TB or tuberculosis. So uh, the disease TB, tuberculosis, is caused from a bacterium. The genus of that bacterium is mycobacterium and the species is tuberculosis. Um, and we know that if we get a specimen into the lab that there's any suspicion, like a sputum culture, any suspicion there could be TB involved, we're going to have to not do a gram stain. I mean, we'll do that too, but we're going to have to also include an acid uh, fast stain to be able to have any chance of maybe seeing this on the original specimen. And by the way, when I say original specimen, that means the specimen that was collected from the patient. So taking pus from a wound and actually putting that pus on us, not just on our media, not just our auger blades, but also on a slide and then doing a gram stain of that slide or an acid fast stain of that slide. That's called an original specimen. Taking sputum and doing the same thing, not just taking the sputum to the culture mediums, but also to a slide and then taking that slide, staining it, going through the staining process, and then looking at it under the scope. This might sound like this is really detailed and whatever, but you can actually take a specimen that's received into a micro lab from a patient an actual patient specimen and make these slides and, and inoculate, inoculate those selective mediums within a few minutes. And you would actually be reading the gram stain under the microscope within minutes of re receiving the specimen. That's what's going on behind the scenes in a microbiology lab. So again, I would want you to know some basics about these stains. I certainly would want you to know the importance of a gram stain and an acid fast stain and when acid fast stains are used. There's some other kind of special stains that we think about that we use for diagnostic purposes. So we have the microbes growing. Um, we have them growing on our culture mediums, whether it's a broth or whether it's an auger plate that's that's semi-solid. So whatever it might be, whether it's a blood culture bottle of liquid, whatever, um, we can do we do the gram stains usually first. But then, if we're suspecting that there might be something that that you know the gram stain leads us to think that it might be a particular organism, we have other special stains we can do to help us to get to that identification. So one of them are endospore stains. These endospore stains are going to be. Um, not all microbes produce endospores, so if we see that there are endospores present, it really leads us toward a certain path for the identification. For example, only gram positives, we think of gram positives, um, producing those endospores and especially two genuses. Clostridium is one of the genuses and in the Clostridium genus, maybe you guys have heard of a disease called tetanus. There's a species of Clostridium called Clostridium tetani, um, so that's a very serious disease. Luckily, we don't see too much of it because we have, we do have, um, we do have, 
Do we have immunizations against that? Sorry, I have somebody beside me that's also talking on the phone in my, in my office near me. I hope you're all getting a lot of that um, feedback from that. But anyway, or maybe you'd rather be listening to that conversation. So let me um, also get back to topic about this. There's another gram positive that we genus that we know that produces endospores called Bacillus. Bacillus is a genus that has one species that's especially dangerous to us, and that species is Anthracis. Bacillus Anthracis, as you can guess, causes the disease known as anthrax. So again, we get the specimens within minutes. We've done slide, we've inoculated slides and, and exposed them to staining techniques. We've inoculated media to try to get them growing, which is going to take hours, unfortunately. So we really rely on our original stains, and we're trying to get to our diagnosis as quickly as possible. Okay, so special stains. Endospores, capsules, we can see some microbes have capsules around the outside of them and some don't. We know which ones do and which ones don't. Some have structures known as flagellum that help them to be moved, to move through um, places. So some have single flagellum, some have polar flagellum, some have uh, multi-trichous flagellum. So we know which ones have, we know what they look like. So that is, is something we can do quickly to help to get to that identification. Here are some of those stains. So you can see this little, these microbes here, these microorganisms, but around them is this almost halo. That means that there is a capsule around that organism. It's an India ink um, stain and that can be done directly on a drop of spinal fluid. So if we think someone has this this causing their meningitis or encephalitis, we can get that spinal fluid, put a drop on a slide with a drop of India ink and be looking at it in less than a minute. Um, and if we see this, this is pretty much diagnostic for that organism. So um, anyway, a, a great tool. These are great tools. All right, now I do want you to, we're moving along. This is chapter, the, these objectives are from chapter three. Um, and one of the first things I want you to know are the differences between bacteria versus eukaryotes. We said that bacteria and archaeobacteria are both prokaryotic, which means that these are domains and they're also kingdoms that don't produce a nucleus. They don't have a nucleus. They're simple. They're tiny. They are so tiny compared to the eukaryotic organisms. So um, we definitely want to know these basic things that make them so different from each other, but also from the eukaryotic, eukaryotes. So bacteria, some things that all bacteria possess. Um, possess or have, they have cell membranes, we have cell membranes too. They have the cytoplasm, cyte means cell, plasm means fluid, so that just means the fluid inside of cells. They have structures called ribosomes, and you would want to know that ribosomes functions are to act as like workbenches, a bench for where proteins get made. And I tell people, you know, our, we really are just all of our cells communicating with each other. And bacteria are kind of like that too, even though they're, they're single celled and they're living independently and they don't really need other cells like we do. We need our kidney cells working with our liver cells, working with our heart cells. We need our nervous system working with everything. But bacteria don't really need that. They're single cell. They can survive just one on their own, right? But um, all cells, I don't care if it's bacteria all the way to the most complex animal cells. All cells are essentially protein factories. That's what we that's what we're doing. We can make carbohydrates, we can all cells can make lipids, all cells can e even produce nucleic acids, but we're essentially protein factories. And that's even the bacteria. Um, that domain we call bacteria. So all of them have these ribosomes, which are workbenches where back where proteins are being made. So we would want to know that. And maybe you remember that proteins are made of 20 different amino acids. Amino acids are the monomer, are the building blocks for proteins. So this workbench, these ribosomes, are, are the areas where individual amino acids come up and get in and they get in line and they hook up like little cars on a train are hooking up, right? So anyway, they have ribosomes and cytoskeletons are going to be the cell's skeletal 
uh, makeup, if you will, and it's called that because it truly does act inside of all of our cells, including bacteria. They have we have this network of highways. Um, so you can think of this as being the skeletal system that keeps the structure, the integrity of the cell intact. Um, and also allows for things to move it within the cell from one area of the cell to another area of the cell. Most bacterial cells have a cell wall, but not all. Um, and most of them have a coating that's known as a glycocalyx. I do want you to know the function of a glycocalyx. A glycocalyx is sort of the outer coating of a cell, and even back most bacteria have this. This outer coating of that cell is where the special identity markers, which are really proteins, are found on that cell that are unique to the cell. So, for example, um, all bacteria have a very unique outfit. So even between species, there are different outfits. All of our cells, like my cells, each have, a, all of my human cells, I have a glycocalyx that is a sugar-like coating where I'm going to find those what are called histocompatibility proteins that are my self-identity proteins. Nobody has the same coding of proteins, self-identity proteins, that I do. And we're all uniquely different in our glycocalyx proteins, which is our coding, our sugar coding, if you will. Um, this is why it's really hard to transplant an organ from one person to another because one person's organ doesn't have the, the cells don't have the same outfit that your cells have. So what happens is your immune system would notice that the self markers aren't there, the self identity markers aren't there, and would try to attack it, would see it as foreign and would try to attack that. Okay, I'm getting a little bit off on the tangent, but I'm going to come back here. Make sure you do know the basics of bacterial cells and what they all kind of possess. Um, there are no organelles, no organized stru structures inside the cell that are going to have a very specialized function, though. So that's just something to also keep in mind. All right, we have, um, depending on the microbe, I've already talked to you about some of them will take the gram stain violet, and some of that will wash off on some, and they'll have to be counterstained with saffronin, so gram-positive versus gram-negative cells. But we don't just have gram reactions that can help us to classify uh, bacteria. We also have their shape and structure and even how they divide. So some bacteria are very round and spherical. They're called cocci. The singular for that is a coccus. And um, again, plural is cocci. Some of them are long, elongated like logs, if you will, and they're known as bacilli or the singular for that is bacillus. Some of them are curved, and the curved ones that almost look like little commas are known as vibrio in shape. Some of them are spiral in shape, so you'll hear of them sometimes referred as spirochetes, depending on um, their structure. So again, when we take an original specimen, or even when we've had something growing for 24, 48 hours, or however long it took it to grow up on our special selective and differential media, wherever we did the stain from, when we look at it, we don't just look at Graham's reaction or special stain typing reactions, we also look at their morphology. Morphology means shape and structure, because that is narrowing down to our identification, and it's all about getting to that quickly. Okay, we're moving along. Okay, I took a tiny bit of break, but I'm back, so we're moving. I'm sure you all needed a break, too. I We're moving along to the objectives that are found in Chapter 4. So we looked at some basic things about bacteria. We said the archaea bacteria, that whole domain, that whole kingdom, we really, the only thing we want to know about that is, because none of them really, caught, that we know of, cause human disease, is that these are ancient uh, forms of life, the descendants that we see that fall into this category are what we know were the first forms of life on this planet, were the first cellular life forms on the planet, but that's that's kind of what we want to know from that, and they live in incredibly harsh environments. So we looked at bacteria, we looked at, we mentioned archaeobacteria, 
Now we're going to the eukaryotic organisms. And the ones that we think about in study in microbiology that are microscopic for us are going to be protozoa, uh, fungi, and then also helminths, which actually belong to the animal kingdom. Helminths you can think of as like worms, okay? So, um, but as far as the four kingdoms of life that fall under eukaryotes, that would be uh, proteist or protozoa, fungi, plants, and animals, okay? So you would definitely want to know that they're the four kingdoms that are eukaryotic. And again, when we talk, when we move into this domain, the eukaryotic domain that has these four kingdoms, we're understanding that the cells have gotten much bigger. The cells, the individual cells are going to be much bigger. They're going to be much more complex. And that complexity is going to require a lot more from their environment. That means that they're going to be um, a little bit needier, much needier than some bacteria. I do want you to understand between these four uh, kingdoms that we talk about and specifically with the three that we talk about in microbiology, they're, they're very unique within themselves. So protozoa are, are mostly single-celled. So just like bacteria were single cell, protozoa are single cell too. There are going to be a few that we mention in each of these categories that a few specific names, genus and species names, that I want you all to start making sure that once we mention a microorganism, um, its genus and species names, you all are writing them down and committing them to your memory. That doesn't mean you're memorizing because that's not learning, but you're committing them um, to your, your bank of knowledge there. So anyway, protozoa are usually single cell. Fungi can be single celled, but fungi, um, some examples of single cell fungi are yeast. So yeast fall into this kingdom known as fungi, but there are also some fungi that are multi cell and multi cell fungi that you know about are moles. So um, the different types of moles, we're going to also mention a few of those and start our introduction into some of those, especially those that have human impact. And then as far as helminths go, parasites or worms that we think about, there's different categories of those. And so we're going to mention a few of those too that are pretty common um, pest, if you will, for for humans. So in looking at eukaryotic cells, a eukaryotic cell versus that bacterial cell, we said that, that they're much bigger, eukaryotic cells are. Um, an analogy was given to me once, and I think this is good to sort of have in your mind. If you think about, most of us have been to a baseball game sometime in our lifetime, we were at a baseball game. So if you think about a traditional size of a baseball field that includes the infield, the outfield, everything about that field. If you think about a human cell as being the size, including the outfield, of a, of a baseball field, a bacteria typically are going to be the size of the pitcher's plate. So in, in perspective, this gives you an idea of how much bigger eukaryotic cells are than bacteria cells. Now, just because we're on this, maybe you it, it's a good time to also mention to you, if you think about the bacteria is now being the size of the baseball field, viruses are the size. Viruses are so much smaller than even bacteria. They're about the size of the pitcher's plate, okay? Not the mound, the plate. So um, just to kind of give you an idea, um, these eukaryotic cells, a lot of them have very... Um, they have specialized organelles that no matter which of the kingdoms you're talking about, those organelles have the same function within any of the eukaryotic cells. So I kind of want to go make sure that just to keep, make sure I, I mention all of them and um, apply it to you so that you have an idea of what they are. I don't want to forget anything. It'd be nice if I could see my, my screen better than I'm seeing it. But anyway, I want to go through the list of these organelles and make sure that you have in layman terms what the functions are. You will need to know organelles that are found inside of the eukaryotic cells, what their functions are. You will have to match them to their functions. So let's just start with the outer part. So uh, in a eukaryotic cell there is a, a cell membrane or sometimes referred to as the plasma membrane. The membranes of our cells keep the inside in and the outside out.
they are often selectively permeable, which means that they allow some things in and, and they would all allow other things in. So they're going to help to keep the integrity of the cell intact. That's a function of the cell membrane. Another thing that you can find on eukaryotic cells, some eukaryotic cells have a flagellum. Flagellums help to propel a cell. So um, that's what a flagellum does. Like in human cells, we only have one human cell type that has a flagellum. It's the sperm, the human sperm. And that flagellum on a human sperm helps to propel the sperm to um, hopefully get to an egg because it, it would need to get there to be able to penetrate for fertilization to occur. But, back, but, but other, other eukaryotic cells can have flagellum as well. Now when we're going inside of the cell, the eukaryotic cell, um, the eukaryotic cells have a, what's called a true nucleus. A true nucleus is where cellular DNA is housed. So this is where all of the DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, a nucleic acid molecule is housed that holds all the recipes for all the traits that will be found in that cell. So that cell does nothing unless it gets instructions from the nucleus from the DNA that's found in the nucleus. You can sort of think about the nucleus as being the administrative office. All the all the um, information for what's going on is coming out of that coming out of that nucleus, and that's going to be important for you to know that it houses the cellular DNA. The way that that information comes out is by little units or bits of information, which we call traits. Those traits come out by, um, by molecules known as RNA, uh, messenger RNA, which are individual trait directives, if you will, and they're tiny, they're small compared to the DNA in, in itself. The DNA molecule is huge, but what will be, re, be written from the DNA are these tiny little singular recipes that then can actually exit through the nuclear membrane, the nucleus membrane, the pores, they can move out because they're small enough too, and they move to a structure known as, um, let's see if I have, I think I can put some more pictures here, structures known as the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is going to be this, this structure that is a double membrane structure that has embedded in it ribosomes, because eukaryotic cells have ribosomes too, which are the workbenches where those proteins are going to get made individual recipes coming out to a ribosome so that one protein can be made at a time um, on each of the individual ribosomes. It happens at incredible speeds, but that's the way that it's happening. And you can see, and I didn't really mention this, but I do want you all to know that what you're looking at here are not just illustrations of like the endoplasmic reticulum and the nucleus itself, but you're also seeing in some of these slides what are called electron micrographs. Electron microscopes, we said that we can use light compound microscopes in a micro lab, and that's true in pathology, to do our identifying of, or of potential pathogens and getting that as quickly as possible. But how we know what's really going on inside of these cells, what I'm talking to you about right now, how we know that is because we've got another type of microscope um, that we can use to know what's going on called an electron microscope. There are a couple of different types of them, but these electron microscopes can see a hundred thousand times magnification. So this is a, this is magnification power that's immense. So this is how we know what's going on inside of the cells, even tiny cells such as bacteria, because we have these electron microscopes that has given us that kind of detail. So the anatomy that we're looking at, what's going on inside those cells, helps us to actually intuitively understand what that physiology is and what it, how it's actually working. So anyway, just to give you an idea of some of these pictures. So let's go back Let's go back, and we, we have mentioned glycocalyxes, that some bacteria have glycocalyxes, but certainly in the eukaryotic um, domain, domain in those kingdoms, they also have glycocalyxes. So each individual species has its own unique combination layer that has its own outfit. Um, and this is, can, can do a lot of, has a lot of different functions. It can actually act as a slime layer and a capsule, but it can protect, it can help 
this glycocalyx layer can help some microorganisms sort of mask themselves from our immune system. And so that's sometimes the way that they can avoid our immune response um, and become pathogenic. They can help them to stick to our cells and again, another way to become pathogenic. So this is that layer that is unique to each and every, each and every different species has their own unique self-identity um, layer. And then we said the nucleus is what houses the, all the instructions, the recipe book for the, what the cell is going to be doing. The cellular DNA actually comes from the parent cell, whatever that might have been, whichever kingdom you were in and you're talking about. The nucleus sends out single individual recipes from its massive recipe book to the endoplasmic reticulum, especially the ribosomes embedded in that endoplasmic reticulum so that proteins can be made. The endoplasmic reticulum is composed of two parts, the rough and the smooth. The rough is called that because the ribosomes look rough on, a, on one of these electron scanning microscopes, it's micrographs. The smooth part is where your lipids in the cells are being made. Cells need to make not just proteins, they need lipids um, for structural components, but also as functions of the, for functions to carry out functions of the cell. And then once these products are made, because the orders were given from the nucleus, once they're made on the endoplasmic reticulum, they're going to move by way of the cytoskeleton, the highway, to an apparatus known as the Golgi, or the Golgi, some people call it the Golgi apparatus, some people call it the Golgi body. But this is a very specialized organelle that is going to then wrap those products that were made on the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, wrap them into vesicles and then ship them out wherever they need to go. Sometimes they just need to be used in the cell but in a different area of the cell. Sometimes they need to be sent to the membrane so that they can be, um, through exocytosis, they can exit the cell and be used by an, a neighboring cell or but sometimes far away, or sometimes sent into just the fluids of the cell. So you can see this process of exocytosis, a cell, that a Golgi that's wrapping and shipping its product, what it's received from the ER, and it's now going to the plasma membrane so that it can actually exit the cell. A couple of vesicles I would like you to know about, there's all kinds of different vesicles, but a couple of very specialized ones. Um, one is called lysosomes. These lysosomes inside of eukaryotic cells, these vesicles, contain digestive enzymes. These digestive enzymes are used within the cell to actually recycle old and worn out products within the cell, old and worn out organelles that need to be replaced. Sometimes these lysosome vesicles are going to hook up with foreign um, objects that have been brought into the cell and then they're going to be destroyed in the lysosome because the lysosome digestive enzymes can eat it away and just um, nullify it, if you will. Lysosomes also play a huge part, and listen to this, and a process called apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. So apoptosis is going to be a process where the cell actually gets instructions to die. Not all cells, even within our, our systems, need, can go on and live forever. They have certain lifespans. We have some of our cells live for hours. Some of our cells need to live for days and weeks, and some of our cells do need to live for decades. But depending on the instructions that our specialized cells are being given as multi-celled organisms, when they do need to die, when the instructions come down from the nucleus that they need to die, the lysosomes play a role in that um, autolysis. It's called self-lysis. Lysis means to split. Auto means self. So autolysis, self-splitting, or cell death, program cell death. Okay, so um, again, I can get off on tangents. I really miss having you all. Did I say that already about missing you all in the, um, in the classroom? So it's very unnatural to be sitting in the office talking to you. But anyway, so there's another organelle I can't not mention. All of this has sounded like a lot of work, hasn't it? And that work requires energy. And the uh, organelle that gives us the energy for ourselves, for multicelled organisms and eukaryotic organisms, are called mitochondria. In the mitochondria, these specialized little structures that are found within the cell, I could go back to a cell, I can go back to the picture of our cell, um, these little 
Well, that's a chloroplast. The little mitochondria look kind of blue here. You can see me pointing to it. But these specialized structures, um, they are they are so unique because of, of their anatomy and how they work. This is where most of a molecule known as ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is produced. ATP is a molecule that acts like a stored battery, a battery that's fully charged. That's how that molecule acts. And if you have a ballot battery that's fully charged, you know, think about that. That's how your phones work. That's how your flashlights work because there's energy in there. Now, once the battery runs out of energy, can it be recharged? Certainly it can. And ATP is a perfect molecule that will act exactly like a fully charged battery. Once it's provided energy, it becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate. But in the mitochondria, ADP can rapidly be another phosphate group be added to it and it can be charged back to ATP. So this is where most of that happens in our very complex cells. You know, we talked about eukaryotic cells. We're much bigger cells than bacteria. We need a lot of energy. Without that energy, we do not last. For, my, for cells that have mitochondria, as long as there's some oxygen present, this, this recharging of batteries is going to occur at a tremendous pace, as long as there's glucose and especially oxygen for this part, then we're going to be able to get enough energy to survive. If you don't believe it's important, think about this. How long can we make it without oxygen? About 46 minutes, is that right? That's about how long we can make it, and, and we're not going to make it after that. The reason being that oxygen, which is the last part of aerobic respiration, Without that, we're not making enough ATP for our cells. Our cells are 24-7 living cells, must have a constant supply of a fully charged battery. And for us, that molecule is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Where we get the most of it, most of that, we, get, we can get some from other parts. But where we get most of it is from these organelles called mitochondria. Then there are also specialized organelles in some eukaryotic cells, especially plants and algae, called chloroplast. Chloroplast are where these, these specialized cells are able to make their own food. Chloroplast are these amazing organelles where photosynthesis is occurring. Photo light synthesis to make photosynthesis is using light to make food. So it's a good trick if you can do it, and they can do it. These these cells that have chloroplast can do it. Something I want you all to know, and it's not in your objectives, but I'll know if you've listened to the recording, which you're supposed to be doing, um, if you get this. Mitochondria and chloroplast also are incredibly unique organelles found within eukaryotic cells in that they have their own, they have their own DNA. So they actually as far as their instructions, they're coming from within those organelles. So let me say that again. Mitochondria and chloroplast are unique organelles because they have their own DNA. They're not being run off of the cellular DNA that's running everything else the cell is doing. They have their own DNA. These, this idea that these two organelles have their own DNA actually supports a theory, a scientific theory called the theory of endosymbiosis. The theory of endosymbiosis is a scientific theory that explains, we said that's an explanatory statement that's been repeatedly supported and um, you know accepted by experts in the field. This is a theory that explains how complex cellular life, protozoa, fungi, plant and animals, came from very simple single cellular life like archaeobacteria. So we know that life on this planet didn't start out with complex multi-celled organisms like us. It started out as, as single cellular organisms like the archae archaeobacteria. Somehow, somehow these organisms were then living symbiotically and started complex relationships, symbiotic relationships that allowed for cells to grow like protozoa and some fungi that are single cell but are now ginormous, right? 
compared to the archaea bacteria, and because more energy was being available to them, they evolved to have even more complex um, cellular processes, and then multi-celled organisms evolved from those. So how complex multicellular life evolved on this planet from single cell simple life forms like bacteria and archaeobacteria, the theory of endosymbiosis is the theory that explains this. And one, one, just one, of the things that support it, there are many other things that are supporting it in science, but one of the things that support it is this idea that we have, we still today, have organelles within our complex cells that had their own, they have their own DNA. Once upon a time, they most likely live separately, but now we're all dependent on each other. We can't live without the mitochondria, and the mitochondria can't live without us. Um, same with the chloroplast. So the theory of endosymbiosis, great, you'll know about it. And you'll know about chloroplast and, de and mitochondria having their own DNA. The cytoskeleton is just an amazingly um, complex system. Like I, I talked to you about the scaffolding or highway system within the cell. And it's how how these molecules are moving, and they are moving. You know, inside of a cell, each of these organelles are not alive on their own. Nothing that I've just talked about. Not the Golgi, not the mitochondria, not the DNA, not the nucleus, not the ER. None of these are alive on their own. But inside of a cell, there's this amazing animation, and there is, there is this movement and this life and this work that's happening um, at a tremendous pace and speed. And the cytoskeleton is one of the ways we know that so much is, is moving, how things are moving around in the cell. So I hope that gave you an overview and, and just an, uh, an appreciation of how much more complex your eukaryotic domain is from the bacteria and the archaea domain. Okay, so let's dig into some of the kingdoms found within the eukaryotic domain. Um, your textbook starts first with fungi. I'm not exactly sure why I would have started with protease, but they didn't ask me. So anyway, we'll do this fungi. So I want you to know that they can be unicellular, single-celled, or they can be multicellular, complex. And I want you to know if you hear the terms yeast or mold, you know that you're in the kingdom known as fungi. So make sure that we understand that. We also um, have certainly heard of mushrooms, and, and so mushrooms fall into this kingdom as well. So you can see the, the big differences from single cell yeast all the way up to very multi-celled macroscopic um, mushrooms that we see and many moles that we see are also macroscopic. We can see them. All right, so this shows you just a little of this. I do want to introduce you to one yeast that is very common as far as humans go and is and causing disease. And it, the name of this is called Candida. Candida albicans. I would expect you to, to just, it's, it's going to be in a slide here soon, but certainly to make sure you get the spelling down and, and even how to pronounce it. So Candida albicans. This is a yeast that we know um, causes diaper rash. It causes thrush, which are the little white patches that can happen inside of the oral cavity, the mouth. Um, it can cause a, a vaginosis or vaginitis, as um, some women are prone to having this. So candida albicans, um, some people can actually get almost systemic disease with candida albicans, which is a yeast, and it's referred to as candidiasis. What we know is that, that sometimes, and it's, it's kind of often uh, an indicator that somebody might have metabolic disease like diabetes, diabetes mellitus, type 1 or type 2, is if, if yeast starts to take over and cause trouble in the body. This can be a real indicator that, that there's something else underlying um, and there's something, a problem going on. So candida albicans are very common yeast. Now, by the way, all of us have candida albicans, have had it on our skin, we've had it in our orifices and, you know, whatever. And most of us will never have a yeast infection, but some of us will. So you, you understand that this is a, is a um, microorganism, a yeast, that's, that's found everywhere and it's found as part of our normal flora. But if given the opportunity, it can become an opportunistic pathogen. And maybe this is a good time to introduce you to that term. 
many microbial diseases, microbes that cause us disease, are actually fall into this category of opportunistic pathogens. So let me, let me again explain what this means. It means that everybody has them on their skin or, like I said, in our orifices, oral cavity, vaginal, colon, urethral, whatever. Um, we have them, but they never cause disease unless they get the opportunity to cause disease. So something has, has harmed that individual in a certain way. And I talked to you about the idea that if you have viruses, you don't want to be treated with antibiotics. And that's because antibiotics upset our normal flora balance. So when you've upset the normal flora balance, can something like yeast take the opportunity to cause disease? Certainly, it's an opportunistic pathogen. Another example, you all have all heard of Staphylococcus aureus. Sometimes you've heard of the, the type of Staph aureus that's really resistant to a lot of different antibiotics. It's called MRSA methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, where did I get that? Where did I get that staph infection? Where did I get MRSA? Most of the time, the people who are saying that, they got it from their own skin because it was it's part of us. It's part of our normal flora. It's part of our, our, our little own microbiomes. A microbiome means the, the microbes that are living in and on you and that are part of your, your own little ecosystem, if you will, your microbiome. But something happened that caused you to be susceptible to that, that microbe that was living there is now taking over and causing disease. Boils, y'all have heard of boils, right? They start with a, a hair follicle becoming blocked, and then the hair follicle, staph aureus, causes boils. The staph that's on your skin can then proliferate and actually end up causing an inflammatory process that leads to what we know as boils. So styes, styes, boils, they're all from staph aureus. You didn't catch them from anybody. It was your own staph aureus on your own skin that took the opportunity to cause disease. The patients who are in the hospital, they're usually in the hospital because something's wrong, right? So they're, they've either been injured through trauma, car accident, you know, whatever, or they've had to have surgery because of something else that's going on. And their bodies have been insulted. And because the bodies have been insulted, the own normal flora on the person, part of the own normal flora, individual ones, can take the opportunity to cause disease. So that's what's meant by an opportunistic disease, an opportunistic pathogen. Okay, so yeast. We said Canada albicans is a yeast. Um, and this is kind of what they look like. They're, they're way bigger than bacteria. So this is why we need to know magnification. When we're looking under a, scope, a microscope, we need to know what the magnification is, the total magnification. We said we know how to do it. We take the ocular times the objective and we know the magnification because the size of the organism can help us to identify the organism because we know what sizes bacteria are. They're tiny compared to what yeast are, which are much bigger. Okay, so there are many species, as you can see, there are many species that can cause human disease. There's certain one, but just a handful of ones that we usually suspect, though. They can be community acquired. They can be from the environment. Uh, and then there are some that we do consider to be hospital-associated infections. So these are just some of the different ones. Um, so or what do I want to tell you from this? Okay, um, I don't think anything. Let's see, I'm moving on. Um, so any of these any of these organisms that we talk about, it's not just that they can become harmful to us. They can also be harmful to other species. Um, they can be harmful to plants, and even we know that there's certain ones that can be harmful. Like there's viruses that can be harmful to bacteria. So it's not just about us. But if we have a fungus that is a prop that's causing a problem in a crop, then obviously you can see what the, that that would be devastating to. Uh, food sources for populations. You've probably all heard of the Irish famine um, that killed more than a million Ar Irish people, actually died from starvation. This was because of a fungus that actually um, hit the potato crop for that, that Ireland was using. Now since then we have understood that we don't want to just have one sort of food crop. So we have variety. Make sure that you know, we don't just have one variety of potatoes. We have different varieties of potatoes because it just takes one good pathogen like this happened 
unfortunately, in the Irish famine, one good pathogen like the sponge eye that came in and took out so much of the food source that so many people died. Um, so, so we do understand that they, that that's it's not just to us. It can actually have an agricultural impact um, to our food sources. So there's lots of benefits too. Fungi are our number one, well, a major contributor to it decomposing dead organic matter on this planet. It was, it's, I heard this from a mathematician once who had sort of extrapolated some numbers about fungi and how they decompose dead matter. So think about all the plants that are dying every day, animals that are dying every day, and other species as well. Um, supposedly without the fungi, their contribution and how they decompose dead organic matter, the earth within a matter of a month would be a mile deep in dead decaying matter. That's pretty impressive. I'm happy about the fungi. So um, anyway, and just understanding that. So we also know that from fungi, from many different molds, we get antibiotics, naturally occurring products from, from fungi like penicillium. Penicillium is the genus of, of a mole species that actually gives us a drug called penicillin. So um, that was one of the first antibiotics that was discovered. So Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin back at the near the beginning, well actually in the 20s, but not until um, we were into World War II did we start being able to purify that and use it as so a first antibiotics. Um, it saved so many lives. It's just it's amazing how many lives it saved. And more, more people died, not from bullets, but from infections, from either bullets or poor health conditions because of malnutrition or, you know, minor injuries that would occur. But more soldiers died from infection prior to the advent of antibiotics than they did from any kind of warfare. Um, just to give you an idea of how important this is. And certainly we know we use um, different fungi for not just antibiotics, but alcohol, um, and vitamins and whatnot, so, and for food. Saprobe, I do want you to understand what the term saprobe means. This is the, um, this is the, this, this terminology and fungi are perfect examples of saprobes. They get their, their nutrients from dead plants and animals. So the way fungi do this is they excrete a digestive enzyme. They're, they're laying on the dead matter. They excrete this digestive enzyme that dissolves the nutrients and then they literally kind of like suck it back in. So that's what a saprobe is. They're heterotrophic in that they do require nutrients from many different organic um, areas and they can be parasitic in that they can grow on living host as well. So um, so this is how fungi kind of work and get their nutrients. Another kingdom within the eukaryotes are protozoa. Protozoa are single cell species and you can see that there are a lot of them. Most of them are harmless. If we went out to a pond or a lake and just got a drop of water and looked at it under a microscope, it would be filled with these really huge cells. You can see them on low magnification uh, because they are eukaryotic, they're huge, and they're in the water and they would never cause us any trouble. But there's some that do. And so um, we're going to mention a few of these and introduce a few that are pathogenic, but most are not. So anyway, um, just, to, just so you're not afraid to swim in ponds and lakes anymore, I wanted to throw that out there. So most of them are single, excuse me, are single cells and they live in the fluids of the host. The ones that are pathogenic can live in the fluids of the host. We have some protozoa that live in and on us as part of our microbiome that never causes any harm. Um, so we do have protozoa that actually live in the colon and um, don't cause us any harm. But one of the ones I want you to know about that's very common is, is a sexually transmitted uh, protozoa is called Trichomonas vaginalis. Some people refer to this as a trick infection most men are asymptomatic of this. They can have it in their urethra, the penile urethra portion um, of the urethra, and certainly it's easily transmitted to a partner, but they don't have any symptoms of it. In a female, it can cause a vaginosis situation or vaginitis, if you will. So it can cause um, a vaginal discharge that can be malodorous and fishy smelling supposedly and so it's considered to be a um, frothy kind of grayish discharge 
that has a bad odor. So, and some women actually are asymptomatic. So this is called a trick, a trick infection, or and it's from a protozoa called Trichomonas vaginalis. There's another um, protozoa that's very common here in this area, in the United States, called Giardia lamblia. Giardia lamblia lives in all freshwater uh, sources in this area. You'd have to get enough of it, drink enough of the water. To, to get this, this is a protozoa that will live in the upper part of your small intestines. So um, it, this is where it will actually sort of migrate to and stay, if you will. Um, and it can cause a, it can cause like abdominal pain and cramping. It can cause diarrhea, intermittent diarrhea with constipation, uh, believe it or not. But it's actually, it, this, this protozoa lives in all the domestic, or excuse me, all the wild animals in this area, so raccoons, you know, think of, I'm, I'm having a blank, but skunks, raccoons, anything that's out there, this lives in their colons. So when they defecate and it rains and that goes into the creeks and the ponds and whatever, th this can be in the water source. You would have to get enough of them, swallow in enough of them to actually get giardiasis, which is the disease that giardia causes, but it's very, very common in this area. One that's not in this area, not endemic to this area, is Entamoeba histolytica. Entamoeba histolytica is a protozoa that actually you would have had to go to Central or Southern America. Uh, so some history of travel in your in your workup, your patients would have had that. And this is very serious. It is more serious than Giardia. And uh, that Entamoeba histolytica can cause a bloody diarrhea and actually in some cases can be um, even life-threatening. So, you know, this is definitely something that somebody would want to take care of. So some of the other more important protozoa, and we're going to mention more of these as we go along, but certainly I would want people to know that um, malaria is from a protozoa and the, the genus that malaria um, it comes from is called plasmodium so make sure that you know that there are four to five different species that cause the disease we call malaria um, but let malaria and, and please pay attention to this because I think in our country we sort of take so much for granted because we haven't had malaria we have had malarial outbreaks before in this country but it's been a long time it's been quite a few decades but as the climate is changing we can expect to have more of them right now malaria kills more than one million people a year in this world. More than one million people die from malarial disease each year. Now, um, you know, that's obviously very serious. And so uh, Plasmodium is a protozoa that actually is going to be infecting our red blood cells. So this is, this is part of this process. Depending on the species, and there are several of them, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium malariae, Falciparum, and um, I, I missed one, but anyway, Falciparum malariae, ovale, oh Lord have mercy, are they on here? Um, and there, there are a couple more, but those are the, are the major ones. That's so crazy. I can't think of that one. Anyway, um, Plasmodium is the genus. causes malaria. We want to know that. And it, it obviously is of concern. Some of the, Another one maybe for right now I would want you to know about. Um, it seemed like there was going to be another one I wanted you to know about. Oh, there's one that's called Neglaria phalera. Neglaria phalera is also endemic in this area. Uh, again, in fresh water sources, it is rare, rare, rare. But Neglaria phalera is a protozoa that um, is sometimes referred to as the brain-eating amoeba. And the mortality rate in this is close to 100%. So meaning that if you, if this amoeba can somehow make it, it usually makes it through your nasal mucosa into the brain. If it makes it into the brain, it is almost 100% fatal. That we know of, but that's that's what that's called the brain eating amoeba. The genus is Neglaria, the species is Phalera. Then the next group and the last group with this are the helminths. The helminths are worms, so tapeworms, flukes, and roundworms. And um, 
you know, so this is what these, this helminthic group falls in the animal kingdom. And certainly most of these we can see with our naked eye, the adults we can, but oftentimes, oftentimes you might miss the, the adults and the only thing that you're actually seeing from specimens that you're collecting are going to be the eggs of the larvae. And so this is why that we include them in our study here. So tapeworms that have these scolixes, which are like little um, hooks that hook into usually the intestines and then they can grow to many feet in length. Flukes, flukes that um, can be liver flukes or lung flukes. There are di many different types of these that, that can also be present depending on on um, what's going on, what the symptomology is, the signs and symptoms that are happening to figure out like what kind of specimens you might need to rule one of these out. Um, so anyway, round worms, we, you know, hook worms, um, ascaris, these are, these are fairly common in our area as well. So, you know, most of the time, here's the good news, it might not be psychologically good news, but here's the good news. Most of us have had some sort of worm before, but uh, if you've ever run barefoot in pastures or if you swim in creek, you learn how to swim in creeks or ponds, then yeah. So anyway, but the good news is that most of the time our immune systems, they're self-limiting. So they're going to stay with us maybe even a few years, but eventually we, they would exit and we wouldn't have them. It wouldn't stay with us forever. So anyway, if they do start to cause problems, those signs and symptoms, they can be diagnosed and they can be treated. This is a good time to bring up this idea, too, though. They can be treated, but when they get treated, these are in the animal kingdom. So the treatments for helmets, you can imagine what you're targeting for their treatment. Our cells have the same, the same structures. So after we've left bacteria, and we are now in the eukaryotic domain with fungi, protozoa, and helmets, treatments become much more harsh to our own cells than just those organisms we're trying to treat because the treatments that we're using are targeting structures that we, our own cells, have too. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, anyway, I put some, I put probably more information you want right now with the helmets, but we'll come back to that later on as we go. A very common uh, worm here is, is actually the pinworm, the aerob Enterobius vermicularis is what we call pinworm. This is very, very common. Um, and so it, it's very common because it's so easy to to, to self-inoculate and auto-inoculate. So it's not like something you have like a tapeworm that lives with you for a few years and then as soon as you, you know, then you can get rid of it um, because the adult dies. This and you didn't get re-inoculated. Re Pinworms, you re-inoculate yourself. So what happens is little kids will have this, and um, it causes intense, intense anal itching. So the scratching of the perianal area, you can get eggs from that area, and then then it, that they get in your mouth or nose again, and you swallow them again. You keep infecting yourself, so you keep it, and it's very contagious between people as well because again. Uh, these eggs can, can be on sheets, they can be on towels, and if somebody comes in contact with them, touches them or their clothes, and then um, touches their mouth or nose or whatever, then they swallow them and now they've got them. So it can be kind of tricky to get rid of pinworms, it can be um, whatever, but it's very, very common. The adult worms come out at night, the adult females come out at night and the, and from the anus. The adult worms are are kind of like the size of a, a grain of rice, but they come out, so they're not big worms like tapeworms and round worms can be, but they're, they come out at night and they lay in the perianal area, they lay their eggs in that area, and that's why that causes irritation in that area and itching. So intense anal itching might be a sign of pinworms. The name is Enterobius vermicularis of those. Okay, um, so you know, honestly, there's millions of helminthic infections just in the United States each year, and um, some of them go, I mean, probably most of them are going undiagnosed, but the good news is most of them are self-limiting, but they're not all self-limiting, and they're not all, um, you know, things that you want to be living with. Some of them cause more discomfort than that. So um, here we are, we're moving on. Viruses. Viruses. I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be right back.
Okay. All right. So viruses are not considered alive. And the reason that they're not considered alive is they don't have any life processes that, like our cells do. There's no animation happening inside of a virus. There's nothing happening. There's no replication of organelles. There's, there's no splitting down the middle and dividing the way bacteria do and making a little clone of yourself. There's no sexual reproduction that's going on in many most of the eukaryotic organism. There's, there's none of that. So viruses are usually considered to be um, active or inactive. That's how we think about them because they have to be living in another living host. And they can sometimes take over the machinery of that living host. So when they do that, then we know that they are active viruses. And um, so we, do, we need, do need to learn about them, but not really alive. And we'll talk about a couple of other non-living um, things that we think about with infectious diseases as well. So first let's look at viruses though. Um, when we think about this, again you can, you can debate that or not, but they're not alive and that's why you don't find them in those three domains or those six kingdoms. They're not in there. They're obligate intracellular parasites. What I do want you to know is that they're, they don't have to even have DNA. Some of the worst viruses we know are actually RNA viruses. They don't even have DNA. They just have RNA. Human immunodeficiency viruses is one of those. Rabies is another virus that's like that. They're RNA viruses. They don't even have their own DNA. And what we know about life is that DNA is that signature molecule of life that dictates everything that's happening at the cell level. So how they're classified is based on their nucleic acid structure, whether they're DNA or RNA. They're also um, going to be classified as which host they attack. So some attack animals, some attack plants, viruses that attack plants, viruses that attack bacteria. So um, we also use that for classifying. As far as their names go, this is talking about the size and just how tiny, um, how tiny viruses are even compared to bacteria how tiny they are another classification is like what structures they have their their outer envelopes some of them are encapsulated some of them are non-encapsulated some of them have these um, rather complex spikes on the outside that can help them to attach to living cells and that helps them to be able to actually then penetrate that cell. This is a picture of a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage looks kind of scary, doesn't it? A bacteriophage is actually a special virus that just attacks bacteria. And actually in science and genetic engineering, we have harnessed bacteriophages to help us to, to actually infect bacteria and to get bacteria to do what we want them to do by inserting even human bits of DNA. This is uh, being done in genetic engineering. It is also thought that bacteriophages using them might be our next level of use of combating very dangerous bacterial diseases to humans because you all know that we have in using uh, antibiotics now, we're almost at the end of our ability to use antibiotics because so many of the bacteria are evolving this is another supportive thing for evolution, but are evolving to be resistant to the antibiotics, the many antibiotics that we've been using over the last 70, 60, 70 years. So we're almost at the end of that run. It's been a good run, but we've got to think about something else that can help us to combat some of these bacterial diseases. And harnessing how, how viruses can attack bacteria is one of the next um, ways, frontiers, if you will, of how we're going to be doing that. So let me see what else I want you to know from that. I'm kind of skipping a little bit, but anything I say, you know, you'll know. Something about viruses that people um, may not intuitively think about, but not all viruses, even viruses that attack humans, can attack all areas of humans. So we have, for example, um, human papillomaviruses, HPV, human papillomaviruses. There are more than a hundred of these viruses, and these viruses cause warts. So some of those human papillomaviruses will only cause warts on the skin, on the palms, on the hands, or the soles of the feet. Some of them can affect the genitalia. Some of them uh, you know, will be very isolated where they where they attach. So human papillomaviruses causes war, cause warts. Warts are actually tumors, tumor growths of the skin. They're usually benign. 
they usually are going to resolve on their own within a couple of years, but that's what they cause. Um, but they're not going to cause a common cold, right? Because there's other groups that can attack and attach to the nasal mucosa. And for common colds that we have, whole categories of viruses that cause what we call common colds. You don't get the same cold twice. You really don't. I know people sometimes think they do, but they don't. There are more than 200 rhinoviruses that uh, that cause common colds. There, there are more than that of adenoviruses, coronaviruses. These are viruses that attack nasal mucosa and cause you to be miserable for a week to seven days, right? So that's because there's certain those cells in our upper respiratory system have markers that allow for these viruses to attack there. There's whole groups of viruses that can only attack your liver uh, cells, your hepatocytes. Hepatocytes are liver cells. So these are called hepatitis viruses. Itis at the end of a word means inflammation of whatever the word was. So hepatic, hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. Um, so anyway, so, so we understand that there are more than a dozen viruses that just attack the liver. Human immunodeficiency virus. No one's ever died from that. No one. That virus though attacks a certain type of white blood cell that you have called the CD4 cell and that white blood cell, that white blood cell is kind of the linchpin, the, the key note to all of your specific immunity. So once that, that virus is attacking that cell, those numbers of that cell goes down, which means that your immune system is not protecting you anymore. You don't end up, people with HIV don't end up dying from the HIV virus attacking, you know, killing off too many of those cells. What they die from are opportunistic infections that, that kill them because their immune system isn't strong anymore. So they end up dying of things like meningoencephalitis, um, meningococcal encephalitis, or they die from pneumonia, pneumocystis pneumonia, which never would have caused anybody that had a normal immune system to be sick. Those organisms are opportunistic organisms that were allowed to make them sick because they didn't have enough of those specialized white blood cells. Because So it's an indirect kind of relationship. No if you get what I mean. So viruses are going to be categorized on the disease that they cause. And actually the naming of viruses is a little bit simpler, if you will, than the naming of the bacteria and fungi and pro proteist, I think you'll find. Because viruses are usually named for the disease that they cause. So we'll take a look at that. And, and they do. They, the way they can attack the cells is they are going to be able to stick to the cell because of something special about that cell. They can penetrate it. Once they get inside the cell, they can then uncoat that, that envelope or that outer coating can come off and start, they can take over the cell's machinery and start making them cells and then be released from that cell. And now there's a lot of them. How do we diagnose them? Viruses. See if this doesn't make sense to you. Viruses, since you, they can only be active inside of a living host cell, maybe it makes sense to you that these are going to be very expensive to culture because we would have to have living cells for them to, to be cultured. So many of the times the way that we diagnose viruses are from the signs and the symptoms that someone has and what it's doing to the cells. Sometimes we can see that even on the microscopic appearance. So the cytopathic effects, CPEs of the cells, are when the viruses are inside the cells, we can see that it's changing the cellular machinery. So this cytocell pathos bad, the bad effect it's having on the cells. So anyway, um, this is one of the ways that we do. I, sp I mentioned signs and symptoms of disease. I think everybody knows what a common cold signs and symptoms look like, but maybe you've never really thought about the definitions of a sign and symptom. Make sure you do know a sign is something you can, you can measure. You can see it and you can measure it. So that's a sign of disease. Um, certainly a rash would be a sign of disease. Certainly a, a fever would be measuring a temperature and it's gone up. That would be a sign. You can measure that of disease. But symptoms are things that are just described to you. So somebody says, my head hurts, or I feel nauseous, or, um, you know, I have whatever. So things that you can't measure are symptoms. But if somebody comes in with enough signs and symptoms that you think, oh, you know, this is like, 
this is probably a common cold, or this may be, you know, whatever. If they have enough of them, this is what helps us to lead to a diagnosis. Though we do know that a lot of diagnoses, most diagnoses, are coming from the labs. But with viruses, which are the most common things that can happen, not always because it's expensive. It's expensive to culture them. Um, some viruses are going to stay with you, and you're never going to be able to um, actually get rid of them. So we know that herpes um, simplex is one of those. When we think about human herpes virus 1 and human herpes virus 2, they're not even designated differently anymore. But human sim herpes virus simplex, these viruses can cause um, you know, skin lesions, so cold sores, genital lesions. It can be in other areas as well. It can be in the eyes. So these are not going to be things that you have and you get rid of. and You, you, know, you can get treated and they're gone. They're going to stay with you. Uh, herpes zoster, which is actually more accurately referred to as varicella zoster. This is a human herpes virus 3. Um, this causes chickenpox, and then once somebody has had chickenpox, they can later develop something known as shingles, which also gives like vesicular types of little blistery vesicles that can happen. What we need to know, though, is that viruses, since they are taking over cellular machinery, we know that they can actually change the machinery of the cell and become cancer-causing. Um, we know that cervical cancer and uterine cancers these are caused from human papillomaviruses. So human papillomaviruses are the cause of those. They, those viruses also cause oral and throat cancer and penile cancer. So the good news is that we have immunizations now that can actually protect people from um, actually having these, these infections. So immunizations have saved countless millions of lives, and we're going to come back to that at another point about immunizations. But um, we know that hepatitis, there are a couple of the hepatitis viruses, hepatitis B and hep B as a boy, C, um, hepatitis B and C, they can both cause liver cancer and, and lead to that. They don't always, but they can. They've been known to do that. We know that the EB virus, Epstein-Barr virus, causes mononucleosis, mono, what people call mono, but we know that it can also, in, in, on rare occasions, lead to lymphomas. So, um, so this, this is of importance to us, and we do need to understand these viruses for that particular reason. So here's a slide mentioning everything I just said as an introduction to viruses. Uh, bacteriophages, make sure you know that these are viruses that just attack bacteria, but in in our labs now, we're actually harnessing this information and using these for genetic engineering um, and hopefully someday to be able to maybe even use it, use this information for controlling what we're calling superbug infections, super microorganism infections, ones that are becoming incredibly resistant to treat. Excuse me. So how do we culture them? We understand that viruses require the living cells. So in vivo means that you've gotten an actual, it's living inside of something that's that an organism that's living. In vitro means it's in cells, but but you still have to keep the cells alive even in a test tube. So so these are the ways that we have to we can culture viruses. They're very expensive. So a lot of times we don't do that. We use signs and symptoms and to get to the diagnosis. Um, but we can also use serology tests, which is going to mean that you can take a person's serum, serology, the study of serum, you can take their plasma, their serum, and you can see if that person has made an antibody response to a particular, um, to a particular virus. If they have, the only way they could have made that antibody response is if they had been exposed to the virus. Your body's immune system is amazing but they're not amazing enough to make antibodies to something they've never seen before. So if a person has a serology test that's positive for an antibody to a particular antigen from a virus, then we know they've been exposed to that virus and that can be our answer. So again, though, to culture, it's going to have, have to actually be from um, using living animals, hmm, using living animals, which is done in labs still, or using bird embryos, so that's definitely done as well, or using living cell culture techniques. This is why when you go into a virology lab, an actual virology lab, which, you know, there are University of Virginia, we have we have one, and um, VCU, I'm sure, has one. But anyway, 
it's expensive. It's very expensive, and um, it's it's something that you know um, we're not going to do for just every common coal. Someone's not going to have that cultured out. Okay. There's another type of non-living infection infectious um, agent that I want you all to be introduced to. They're called prions. A prion, and make sure you know this, a prion is a self-replicating protein. It goes against everything that we think about as far as like um, biology is concerned, the study of life, because everything we we know about living things is that living things only are, are at a cellular level and cells produce proteins and they only produce proteins because DNA dictates what proteins are going to be produced and we know exactly how we get from DNA nucleic acids to proteins and we know exactly how that happens and then all of a sudden we discover that there's something and thank God it's really rare called prion diseases where a person gets exposed to this protein, this aberrant kind of protein known as a prion that can actually enter into the human cell and, and start causing more prions to be produced that are abnormal proteins, so self-replicating proteins that happen in the central nervous system that cause diseases known as spongy form encephalopathies. Um, in animals, you've heard of mad cow disease or sheep scrappy, you've heard of that. But in humans, it causes a disease and known as, as CJD. It's pronounced crutchfield jakob syndrome or disease, but it is terminal. It's fatal 100% of the time. It is fatal. There is nothing so far that we can do about it. It's going to be a progressive fatal disease. So prion diseases are definitely of concern and um, I want you to understand that these spongy form encephalopathies, if I were to break that down, what it just means is that your brain, and your brain encephalopathies, bad things that happen to your brain, it turns your brain to sponges, creates these entire holes. It's actually liter literally eating away at this. And we know that because of the biopsies that are done at the end and the scans that can be done as the disease is progressing. So, um, so this is why we also have protocols for people who, um, who are eating meat or you know these, whatever that that you do not eat the central nervous system of an animal, and you also the animals that you are eating are animals that have appeared healthy. If there's an animal that has appeared like it had a nervous system disorder, um, you know stumbling or walking around in circles or doing anything that would suggest that there was a nervous system disorder, that meat is not going to be used. But even in uh, meat processing centers in the United States and developed countries, that when they are processing the meat, they're very, very careful never to expose any of the meat that's going to be used for eating to be exposed to the central nervous system. Um, the brain and the spinal cord are going to, the technique for moving it out is very, um, hopefully, regulated so that that even if some, a prion was there, it won't be um, in the meat that's going to market. How many want a hamburger right now? Okay, that's not funny. All right, so prions, viroids, viroids. I'm never going to mention them or test them to, or test you on this, so I just put it in here now. But um, these are these aren't even. We said viruses are really kind of simple in their structure. They're not even alive. Uh, they're just a nucleic acid, whether it's RNA or DNA, that's been wrapped. But a viroid's even more simple than that. And these viroids are actually virus-like agents that um, can parasitize plants. Now, certainly, this might be some. Of the, the, if you think about it, they have an indirect impact on humans, and that they can cause an economic uh, impact and agricultural impact to our crops. But I'm not going to ask you about viroids, but Viruses, prions, and viroids. These are going to be um, agents that we don't consider them to be alive, but they certainly um, can cause some issues. So anyway, that's a lot of information uh, for this second, you know, the second unit, if you will, chapters two through five. Um, good luck with that. I'm going to try to, unless we talked about it, 
and or it's not in these objectives that you all will do from your readings and whatnot fine you will not be, have any quiz questions on anything that we didn't talk about or that you could find in here um, on this or on eventually the test that comes from this so thanks a lot and um, thanks for bearing with me in this artificial sort of environment and I'll talk to you soon <laughs>